Hi, this is Professor Erica Jones, and I'd like to welcome you to this lecture about fluid and electrolytes. Uh, fluid and electrolytes are something that you're going to be working with for your entire nursing career. Um, there are many different things that impact a person's fluid balance and their electrolytes. Um, and it's up to you to know what normal is and what to expect when something abnormal happens. Uh, the objectives for this lecture are that you're going to be able to describe the location and function of different body fluids, including the factors that lead to alterations. You're going to be able to describe the function, regulation, sources, and losses of the main electrolytes of the body. You'll be able to explain the processes of active and passive transport, osmosis, diffusion, active transport, and filtration. Um, these are things you should have learned already in anatomy and physiology, so for most of you it will just be review. Uh, we're going to talk about how thirst and the organs of homeostasis function to regulate fluid and electrolyte balance. The body actually does an extremely good job of maintaining homeostasis. And we're going to talk about the major electrolytes, what their functions are in the body, and what happens when they are out of balance and you'll be able to identify, assess, and use the nursing process to treat fluid and electrolyte imbalances. So the functions of fluid and electrolytes in the body are that they maintain your blood volume, they regulate a normal body temperature, they assist in transporting nutrients, hormones, and blood cells to and from the cells, they serve as a medium for cellular metabolism and proper cellular chemical functioning. Uh, potassium, for example, without enough potassium in your body, your cardiac function is impaired. So it's important that you understand what electrolytes are um, necessary for certain functions in the body. Uh, fluids and electrolytes act, act as a solvent, the fluids do for electrolytes and non-electrolytes. And they also facilitate digestion and promoting elimination. One of the first things we say to our patients when they're complaining of constipation, drink more water. There's probably not enough fluid in your body. And they also act as a tissue lubricant. When talking about compartments within the body that contain your fluids, um, there's two main areas. There's fluid that's contained within the cells, so that's intracellular fluid. And there's fluid outside the cells, which is extracellular fluid. Um, these two things combined make up your blood volume. Your blood is comprised of mostly extracellular fluid or plasma and also red blood cells, which have fluid that's contained within them. One of the ways that I like to explain a person's blood volume is by using the analogy of soup. So if I were to have a pot of soup on my stove, um, the broth of the soup is considered the extracellular fluid, and say I'm making soup with beans, the fluid inside those beans would be the intracellular fluid. So for example, the beans are your cells and the fluid within them is the intracellular fluid. Um, when you talk about different areas within the body, the interstitial fluid lies in spaces between the body cells. Excess fluid within this interstitial space is called edema. So if a patient has heart failure and they have swelling in their ankles, that's interstitial fluid because that fluid is in spaces between the body cells. Intravascular fluid is the plasma within the blood. Uh, its main function is to transport blood cells. And transcellular fluid includes specialized fluids such as your cerebrospinal fluid, pleural fluid, peritoneal and synovial fluid found within the joints, plus the digestive juices that are within your digestive system.
those are very specialized fluids. Um, and remember that the function of fluid within the body in those little blue circles on the far left, circulation, transport of nutrients and cells, and temperature control. All of this is part of your fluid volume. There can be variations in fluid content. A healthy person has 50 to 60% of their body weight made up of total body water. An infant has considerably more body fluid and extracellular fluid than an adult. 75% of an infant's body is fluid. They're much more prone to fluid volume deficits. That's why it's important to be able to recognize dehydration in an infant because they have, um, they're far more at risk for that because their body is more made up of water. Um, people that are uh, overweight have less body water because they have more fat cells that take up space, and women also have less body water. Total body fluid represents 50 to 60 percent of the body weight of a normal adult, and you can see by this diagram extracellular fluid is 15 to 20 percent of the body weight and that extracellular fluid is made up of 5 percent plasma and 10 to 15 percent interstitial fluid and then fluid within the cells is 35 to 40 percent of a person's body weight for a total of 50 to 60 percent of your body weight made up out of fluid and this is a nice diagram that shows kind of your beans within your soup, your red blood cells. The fluid within them is intracellular, your white blood cells the same, intracellular fluid inside those cells. And then the extracellular fluid that's within this vascular space is your blood volume, essentially your intravascular volume. And then there's also extracellular fluid that's outside of that cell membrane in the interstitial space outside of the blood, the blood vessel. Electrolytes are substances that have an electrical charge associated with them. Um, the cations have a positive charge like your sodium and your anions have a negative charge like your chloride. You might see some of your electrolytes abbreviated with either a plus sign or a negative sign after them and that's because they carry either a positive or a negative charge. To maintain homeostasis, the cations, the positive charged electrolytes, will be equal to the anions and you might see in a patient with DKA or who is ill that they might have what's called an anion gap because those two don't equal up. But for a healthy person, the cations will equal the anions. <laughs> it's just a little cartoon because if you need to help remember positive is cat. Some people like cats and they are positively charged. Uh, when you talk about fluid balance, there's a couple terms that you should know. A uh, solvent is a liquid that holds a substance in solution. So like, for example, water can hold a substance in solution. It's the major solvent in the body. A solute is the substance that dissolved in a solution. So electrolytes and non-electrolytes are, are dissolved in the solvent in the body. Um, this example here is uh, the brewed coffee in the cup is acting as a solvent and the sugar mixed into it will be a solute. We're going to go over each of these electrolytes and talk about their functioning in the body separately, but this is just a slide that gives you basic chief functions of each of the major electrolytes. Please do review Trees and Wilkinson, uh, read that entire chapter 39, except the part about acid base, because that's something you'll have in your senior year. Um, and you're going to want to review especially the table 39.3. And also review in your Lewis book, um, page 271, table 16.1. This is a true-false question. Molecules in the body's chemical compounds that remain intact are called electrolytes. It is 
false because molecules in the body's chemical compounds that remain intact are non-electrolytes. So for example, glucose and urea, they are always going to be the same. They're always the same composition. Um, it's your electrolytes that have uh, electrical charges. The transportation of body fluids, again, this is a review likely for many of you from the A and P, but you're expected to know what the difference is between osmosis, diffusion, active transport, and filtration. Uh, osmosis means the water will pass from an area of lesser solute concentration to greater concentration until equilibrium is established. For example, if I have a very salty pot of soup on the stove and I pour water into that pot, eventually it will get mixed up so that every area will have the same amount of salt in it. Um, diffusion is the tendency of solutes to move freely throughout a solvent, so they just travel downhill. Active transport is a mechanism that requires energy for movement of substances through the cell membrane from the lesser solute concentration to the higher solute concentration. One of the best examples of this is the sodium potassium pump when talking about cardiac function. It uses energy to transfer um, substances through the cell membrane. Filtration is passage of fluid through a permeable membrane from the area of higher to lower pressure. A good example of this is patients who have dialysis. Uh, their blood volume is passed through a membrane, the dialysis filter, and that pressure forces certain substances to go through the filter and other substances stay and get filtered out of the blood. When we talk about osmolarity of a solution, um, we're talking about blood volume particularly, um, but it can refer to many other things. There are some great videos posted that will be helpful if you're having difficulty uh, comprehending osmolarity of a solution. Um, when we talk about isotonic, we're talking about solutions with the same concentration of particles as plasma. Solutions that are hypertonic have a greater concentration of particles than plasma. And hypotonic have a lesser concentration of particles than plasma. And I like to, um, it really helps me a lot to think about our blood volume and our plasma kind of as salt water because 0.9% saline, normal saline, is about the same osmolarity, tonicity as plasma. So if you think about your blood volume as salt water, uh, that will have the same concentration of particles as plasma. So normal saline is isotonic. When you look at a 3% sodium solution that has more salt in it than your blood volume, that would be referred to as a hypertonic solution. It's saltier than your regular blood volume. And if you're looking at regular water, say for example D5W, which is technically isotonic but has no salt in it and when it enters your body your body uses that dextrose the water at that point is a hypotonic solution it has lesser concentration of particles than your plasma does and we'll talk about this a little more in further slides this is a nice example of filtration uh, there are a couple different ways in which uh, filtration occurs in the body. Uh, the first one is colloid osmotic pressure, um, and the second is hydrostatic pressure. So colloid is another word for protein, and when you have a blood volume, you have a certain amount of protein in it, and when it's present in your blood vessels, that increases the pressure of the protein and it will pull fluid in from the interstitium. Hydrostatic pressure is the force of the fluid flowing through the blood vessel and it will push fluid out of the vessel. So these two um, different 
types of filtration help to keep your blood volume inside your blood vessel. Uh, patients, especially patients who have liver damage, who have uh, very poor amounts of protein in their blood, in their body, they are very prone to having edema because they have poor osmotic pressure. They don't have enough protein to hold that fluid in their blood vessels, and the hydrostatic pressure will push the fluid outside of the blood vessels and cause edema. Patients with heart failure who have high, high blood pressure have an increase in the hydrostatic pressure, and they also can be susceptible to edema because that high pressure in the blood vessel will push more fluid out. So what are the sources of fluid for the body? There are things that we take in, ingested liquids, there's a certain amount of fluid in the foods that we eat, and also metabolism produces some fluids. Fluid losses uh, are divided into sensible and insensible loss. Sensible loss is something that can be measured. So for example, when we pee, we can measure the amount of urine that comes out and keep track in our eyes and nose. If we poop, we can keep track of that as well. And this patient here has a couple surgical drains and you can see that that amount that's coming out of his body can also be measured. Um, insensible loss is something that you can't measure. It's perspiration when you're sweating, you lose fluid through the skin, and also when we breathe, there's a certain amount of fluid that comes out with the hum humidification of our breath. Uh, these things can't be. For patients who are healthy, the fluid intake is going to about equal the fluid loss. So for this patient, the example here is that they uh, have taken in 1,300 mils of water. They've ingested 1,000 mils of food. They've possibly created 300 mLs of fluid through metabolic oxidation. So they've had a total intake of 2,600 2,600 mils. And then for output, they've peed out 1,500 mils of urine. They have uh, lost about 600 mils through the skin, 300 mils through the lungs, and 200 mils from the gastrointestinal tract. So they've had an output of 2,600. It's important for your hospitalized patients for you to keep track of their I's and O's so that you can know whether or not they're positive throughout their hospital stay. Um, especially patients who are receiving a lot of IV fluids, they can build up quite a bit of um, fluid and it will be helpful for you to know just about where those patients are as far as their fluid volume. The primary organs of homeostasis are your kidneys. Uh, they normally filter 170 liters of plasma and excrete one and a half liters of urine in 24 hours. Uh, hormones such as renin and aldosterone regulate the volume in your body. The cardiovascular system pumps and carries nutrients and water in the body. The lungs regulate oxygen and carbon dioxide levels of the blood. The adrenal glands help the body conserve sodium, save chloride and water, and excrete potassium. And the pituitary gland stores and releases ADH. All of these organs contribute to homeostasis in the body. The thyroid gland increases the blood flow in the body and increases renal circulation. The thyroid is really like that thermostat for your body. Uh, the nervous system inhibits and stimulates mechanisms influencing fluid balance. The parathyroid gland is responsible for calcium in the extracellular fluid. The GI tract absorbs water and nutrients that enter the body through this route. And please see your Lewis book, page 271 to 275, Adrenal Cortical Regulation, table 16.9 on page 275. This is a nice uh, overview of the organs of homeostasis, especially the kidneys. So when we're talking about the kidneys, we are talking most specifically um, about 
the way that they work with antidiuretic hormone and aldosterone to maintain your blood volume. So first we'll talk about ADH, antidiuretic hormone, also known as vasopressin. Uh, this hormone is produced by the hypothalamus and it is stored and released by the pituitary gland. Um, antidiuretic hormone, when we think about diuretic, we think about makes you pee, right? Lasix, I give my patient Lasix, it's a diuretic, it's gonna make them pee. Antidiuretic means you're not going to pee. You're going to hold on to water. So when you think about antidiuretic hormone, meaning you're not going to pee, when we think about how this gets uh, released, it happens when you have increase in your serum osmolality. So your serum becomes more salty or you have a decrease in your blood volume. So say I you know, get into a car accident and I lose my leg and I have this big loss of blood. My brain is gonna release ADH and my kidneys are gonna hold on to water. And now there's two different reasons they might hold on to water, right? If my blood has too much solute in it, if it's too salty, it's gonna hold on to water to decrease that salt volume, right? Or if I have a loss of blood volume, like I've just bled out a liter, the kidneys are gonna to wanna to hold on to water because my volume is off, right? I'm gonna lose water that way. So it's gonna hold on to water and help try and increase my blood volume. Conversely, if I have a decrease in my serum osmolality, so my blood volume is not salty at all, or I have an increase in my blood volume, meaning there's too much blood on board, it's going to inhibit the release of ADH. And what am I going to do? I'm going to pee. Water is going to be excreted by the kidneys and my urine will be less concentrated because I'm trying to get rid of that extra volume. The renin angiotensin aldosterone system is another way that the body maintains homeostasis. I love this little cartoon of the heart holding on to the kidneys. When you get out there to be nurses, make sure you drink lots of fluid because you want to be good to your kidneys because they are hugely important for maintaining fluid volume, balance, and blood pressure. So talking about RAAS, and of course you're going to have to review this on your own because this is not nearly enough of an explanation for you to really understand it, but renin is secreted by the kidneys. It produces angiotensin II. Angiotensin II is going to vasoconstrict, so it's going to squeeze down on those blood vessels and it's going to stimulate the production of aldosterone. Aldosterone is going to increase your blood pressure. If you have a decrease in blood flow to the kidneys, so if, for example, if I have a big hemorrhage and lose a bunch of blood volume, or a decrease in sodium reaching the glomerulus, more renin will be secreted. This will, in turn, cause vasoconstriction and increase the blood pressure. If you have an increase in the blood flow to the kidneys, or an increase in sodium reaching the glomerulus, less renin will be secreted and that's going to reduce vasoconstriction and it's going to drop your BP. So many blood pressure medicines are vasodilators. That means your blood vessels are going to relax and your blood pressure is going to drop. This is a knowledge check question. A hypertonic solution has a greater osmolarity, causing water to move out of the cells and to be drawn into the intervascular compartment, causing the cell to shrink. And the answer to that question is true. A hypertonic solution, so like a 3% saline, has a greater osmolarity. It causes water to move out of the cells and to go into the intravascular compartment, causing the shell to shrink. And I like to think if you've been soaking in the ocean for an hour or two and you look at your fingers and they're all wrinkly, probably because the salt has taken your fluid out of your cells. 
This is a lovely picture about the osmotic pressure's effect on red blood cells in the body. The tonicity of a solution, so how salty it is, affects the cell. Hypertonic solutions will draw water out of the cell, causing it to shrink. Right here we see the effect of a hypertonic solution on the cell. An isotonic solution, so 0.9% saline, the same tonicity as your body's normal extracellular fluid, it's going to be equal. There'll be um, a maintenance of this cell volume. These are nice looking red blood cells like little frisbees. A hypotonic solution, the water is going to go into the cell and it will cause the cell to swell up and eventually burst. Here's just one more picture in a different order. So this is the isotonic solution, which is equal, and it maintains the red blood cells uh, shape. This is a hypertonic solution where that water is being drawn outside of the cells, making them all wrinkly. And this is a hypotonic solution where the water is going into the cells and these cells are plumped up and will eventually swell and burst. We have talked already about 0.9% saline. Uh, that's about the same concentration as extracellular fluid. This is given in, uh, to patients who have volume loss. It's administered to expand the volume of extracellular fluid. It will dilute your hemoglobin and hematocrit. So going back to that example, if I lost my leg in an accident and I've bled out a bunch of liters, if they give me three liters of saline, it's going to maintain my volume. It'll help maintain my blood pressure, but it's not going to have the same oxygen carrying capacity as my blood cells will. I'll still have lost those blood cells. And if you check my H and H, it's going to be lower after you've given me saline because it has been diluted by that saline. Um, it doesn't going to, it's not going to affect your cellular dynamics, so your red blood cells, because it's an isotonic solution, they're going to say this, stay the same shape. They're going to have that nice concave appearance. Um, other isotonic solutions besides normal saline are lactated ringers. D5W is a tricky fluid. We'll talk about that in a couple more slides. Just in the bag, because of the dextrose, it is isotonic. And when you're giving any kind of fluid to patients who have kidney disease or heart disease, you want to watch them closely for overload because your kidneys and your heart are two of the organs of homeostasis. And if they're not functioning correctly and you're giving someone excess fluid, uh, they can get into trouble pretty quickly. Hypertonic solutions are a higher solute concentration than another solution. They have less fluid relative to an adjacent fluid. Um, fluid from areas of less concentration will move to areas of higher concentration, causing cells to shrink. Particular reasons that people receive hypertonic solutions include hyponatremia, brain injury, and severe swelling. This little picture here in the corner is 23.4% hypertonic saline. This is only used in the neuro ICU for severe brain injury. You might see in your clinical setting in acute care a 2% or a 3% saline solution being given for hyponatremia. Um, occasionally it's given for brain injury. Um, Fluids that contain dextrose and saline are hypertonic because um, that's the way they're that's the way they are. Dextrose five percent lactated ringers, dextrose ten percent, and dextrose five percent in normal saline. Those are all hypertonic solutions. Uh, they are irritating to the veins. So for patients receiving hypertonic solutions, um, it'll be your facility's policy which one of them need central IV access because they may be too irritating for a peripheral IV. These patients receiving hypertonic solutions, you're going to closely monitor their electrolytes and especially if they're getting dextrose, their glucose levels as well. 
Hypotonic solutions are going to have a lower volume of solute than the surrounding fluid. They will be indicated in severe dehydration or volume depletion. They consist of half normal saline, also known as 0.45% normal saline, dextrose 2.5 in water, and dextrose 5 in water. So dextrose 5 in water, like we mentioned before in the isotonic section, is an isotonic fluid in the bag. Once the patient receives that isotonic fluid, that dextrose gets metabolized in the body, the glucose, and it becomes water. It's like giving someone water. It is never, ever, ever to be given to infants or to brain injured patients because think of your cells when you put them in water. They swell up and they burst. There's a high risk of cerebral edema for these patients because the hypotonic fluid will damage those cells. If someone's receiving a hypotonic fluid, you want to closely monitor their vital signs, their level of consciousness, their electrolytes, their glucose levels, and the fluid volume status and urine output of the patient. I can tell you, um, I was working for the nursing pool one day, uh, one night, I always work nights, and I came into the hospital and I was taking care of this little old lady who had come in uh, two days prior for treatment of pneumonia. And because she was elderly and she hadn't had good intake prior to her hospitalization, she was fluid depleted. And the physician who was caring for her had started her on D5W at 100 milliliters an hour. And she was a tiny thing. And when I came in to see her for the first time, she had this fully in place that was full of dilute urine and she was not in her right mind. This poor thing is in the bed, definitely confused. Her um, admission note from two days ago said that she was alert and oriented and just ill with pneumonia. And because the physician had started her on a hundred an hour of D5W and had not thought to check back on her and because the nurse caring for her didn't think that was an unusual order and continued to give the fluid for two days, um, she now had some cerebral edema from all that hypotonic fluid going in. So we stopped the fluid, called the physician and, you know, got her situated. But make sure when you're when you have a patient who's getting fluid that you know why the fluid is running that's running and understand what you're supposed to monitor for as the nurse. Oh, and here we are, a nice little photo evidence picture of what fluid is running and why. And it talks about your isotonic fluids on the top, uh, lactated ringers, normal saline. Uh, these are isotonic, they're used for fluid resuscitation, they're used for volume expansion, um, and you'll also see uh, little, the little bags of saline running uh, just to keep the vein open. Then we get down here and your seesaw tipping up. There's a hypotonic fluid and they use D5W as an example. Now, it's, it says here, kind of tricky, I'm isotonic until inside the body. Then I metabolize the glucose and become hypotonic. Hypotonic fluids are never to be given to infants or head injury patients because they can cause cerebral edema. Hypertonic fluids, D5 half normal saline, D5 normal saline, your hypertonic salines, 2%, 3%, they're used for sodium and volume replacement. Caution, go slow, monitor BP, pulse rate, and quality of lung sounds, as well as serum, sodium, and urine output. So they're not to be given lightly. If your patient's not receiving an isotonic fluid, make sure you know why and make sure you know what to monitor. So moving on to fluid imbalances, these involve either the volume or distribution of water or electrolytes. Hypovolemia is a deficiency in the amount of water and electrolytes in the extracellular fluid with near normal water and electrolyte proportions. Dehydration is a decreased volume of water and electrolyte change. Volume overload is an excess of fluid in either the intravascular or extravascular space. 
And you might hear the term fluid spacing or shift. Uh, sometimes third spacing is used. This is a distributional shift of body fluids into potential body spaces, such as edema or ascites. And there's a nice table in Lewis on page 276 to review about fluid imbalances. So what are the signs of dehydration? Thirst. Thirst is going to be your most frequent indicator that something is wrong with your patient. Your patient's complaining they're thirsty. When I worked in the cardiac ICU and those patients were on a bunch of diuretics because they all had heart failure, everyone complained of being thirsty. Um, their urine will be concentrated. Uh, normal urine output in a human is 0.5 cc's per kilogram per hour or approximately 30 cc's or mls an hour. So if you have your patient for four hours and they only void 50 mls, that's less urine output than normal. They can have dry skin, they can have sunken eyeballs, a dry tongue, dry conjunctiva, and decreased tearing of the eyes. Patients that are dehydrated can have mental status changes and you're gonna to wanna to review the physical assessment of fluid volume deficit. They, you'll hear people say sometimes the patient looks dry. So what does a patient look like when they're dehydrated? And please make sure that you know these dehydration signs and symptoms. Um, your patient will have flat neck veins, they can be hypotensive, they can have tachycardia, often you'll feel a weak thready pulse, their extremities may be cool, they may be breathing fast, you may have a patient with a low grade fever, um, water weight is lost more quickly than other types of weights, so a patient who is down a couple liters of fluid might have acute weight loss. Um, their H and H might be elevated as a result of hemoconcentration because they don't have enough uh, water in their soup. So their H and H will be up. Their BUN and glucose may also be elevated. And you might see an elevated sodium as well, greater than 150. And urine specific gravity, which measures the amount of solutes in a patient's urine, will also be elevated greater than 1.03. The causes of dehydration, uh, poor intake of fluid, inability to keep fluid down like vomiting or diarrhea, and patients that have a high fever without adequate fluid replacement. So the opposite of fluid volume uh, deficit is fluid volume excess or overload, also known as hypervolemia. Uh, it results from excessive retention of water and sodium in the extracellular fluid. Patients with hypervolemia can have jugular venous distension. This picture lower left is a nice example of what you see when a patient has jugular venous distension. Those neck veins are full of fluid and often when you can when you assess these patients, you can see them pulsing. Um, they have above normal amounts of water in their extracellular spaces. And that excessive extracellular fluid can accumulate in, two spa in tissue spaces, and that's known as edema. So this picture on the lower right, we have a patient with what's called pitting edema. These marks are actually from the person's fingerprints who assess them, uh, probably trying to feel pulses and leaving marks in the swollen feet. Um, patients can have movements of fluid from the space surrounding cells to the, to the blood. That's called an interstitial to plasma shift. And, um, you know, with fluid volume excess, um, patients definitely have a lot of fluid on board. And the goal is always to try to keep it in the um, intravascular space. So you're going to try and prevent this kind of edema from happening. So what are the causes of fluid volume excess? We have uh, renal failure, heart failure, excessive fluid intake, although a patient with healthy kidneys would have to um, have a very excessive fluid intake for them to get um, 
overloaded because their kidneys are going to pee it all out if they're working. Um, patients can have high corticosteroid levels and high aldosterone levels that can lead a patient to be overloaded. This picture here is a patient receiving dialysis, um, so patient with kidney failure. Those patients are um, folks that you want to watch closely when you're talking about fluid uh, volume because their kidneys don't work and they're not able to um, get rid of extra volume like a person with healthy kidneys would be. And please review your physical assessment findings for fluid volume overload. This is a repeat of the previous uh, slide about the electrolytes and their chief functions. Um, this is all in a table, um, 39.2, on page 1386 in your trees book. And there is a blank study guide that's been provided to you in um, your Blackboard resources, please print that out and while you're studying in your text, fill it out so that you know, you know that sodium is going to be the controller of your body fluid volume and potassium is going to regulate cellular enzyme activity and water content. Um, make sure that you take some time to learn about the major electrolytes and what their functions are. This is a diagram that you don't have to know, but I find it really helpful in the clinical setting because it's a simple diagram that just is a snapshot of your patient's uh, lab values, their electrolytes, their BUN, their creatinine, their glucose, and the H&H, &H, as well as the white blood count on the left and the platelets on the right. And then the divalence, calcium, magnesium, and FOS in that little trio on the upper right side. Um, it is really nice to be able to document your labs for your patient in this concise fashion. Which one of the following electrolyte imbalances occurs due to a sodium deficit in extracellular fluid caused by either a loss of sodium or a gain of water? And the answer is going to be A, hyponatremia. Um, hyponatremia refers to a sodium deficit in the extracellular fluid, which can be caused by either a loss of sodium or a gain of water. It refers, hypernatremia refers to a surplus of sodium in the extracellular fluid. Hypokalemia refers to a potassium deficit, and hyperkalemia refers to an excess of potassium in the extracellular fluid. And review your electrolyte imbalances table in the trees book when you're going over your electrolytes. So sodium controls and regulates volume of body fluids. That's why they tell patients with heart failure to watch your salt intake because water follows salt. So if I decide that I'm going to have a huge ham dinner and I have like three grams of sodium with my next meal, the next day I'm probably going to notice a little swelling in my hands, maybe a little swelling in my ankles because all that sodium that I took in, water is going to follow it and it's going to hold on to water. So I'm going to have a little extra volume on board because I have extra sodium on board. A sodium value of less than 135 is considered hyponatremia. The normal value is 135 to 145. It can be what's referred to as a dilutional hyponatremia with an excess of body fluid diluting the amount of sodium present, such as patients with, with heart failure and renal failure. When you think dilutional hyponatremia, I think somebody put a bunch of water into my soup and so my soup is going to be less salty and the amount of salt has been diluted. Um, it can also be euvolemic as in uh, some special situations like cerebral salt wasting or SIDH which we'll talk about later on in the lecture and it can be hypovolemic as in diuretic therapy, GI losses, or fever. So if your patient has been receiving a bunch of Lasix and they have peed out all their volume, but they've also peed out a bunch of potassium and sodium, they can be hypovolemic with a low water volume in their body, and they can also be hyponatremic as well with a sodium less than 135. Symptoms of hyponatremia are usually um, 
a cerebral uh, nervous system related changes. Um, so patients can get confused, they can get delirious, they can be irritable, have confusion. Uh, they can also be weak and tired and suffer from dizziness. In severe cases, they can have seizures and coma. And remember those patients that you don't want to give D5W to? Um, you don't want to do that because they can have neurological damage from cerebral, demyla, cerebral demyelination. It's a rare thing that can happen, but if your patient is, um, you know, has a very low sodium, don't be surprised if they have, you know, neurologic effects from that. If the patient is also hypovolemic, you may also see tachycardia and hypotension. SIADH is a, it's called the, syn the syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone. So what happens is the body increases the secretion of antidiuretic hormone. This can occur for many different reasons. It can be because of uh, malignancies, central nervous system disorders, pulmonary disorders, um, certain medications can cause SIADH. Um, the Osmolality of the plasma and the sodium are both decreased, secondary to water retention. So it's a dilutional hyponatremia because your body is holding on to water. Remember, antidiuretic hormone means that you're not going to pee, but if they increase the um, antidiuretic hormone secretion, you're really not going to pee. You're going to hold on to all of that. Um, water and you're going to have a low sodium as a result. The way that this is treated is you have to identify what's causing the SIDH and then correct that underlying problem. This is a little graphic about hyponatremia. Um, signs and symptoms, lethargy, headache, confusion, apprehension, seizures, and coma. It occurs when the serum sodium is less than 135 milliequivalents per liter. Decreased sodium is caused by dilution as a result of excess water or increased sodium loss, and that can happen due to any one of these situations down here. Um, patients can have diarrhea, they can have GI losses or vomiting, they can be um, taking diuretics. It can be caused by fluid shifts um, as a result of mannitol, which is another type of diuretic. Um, that leads to a dilutional hyponatremia as well. Um, and it can also be from inadequate salt intake. How do you treat it? You can treat hyponatremia by giving replacement therapy. Some patients can even receive salt tablets if it's not you know, too uh, acute of a problem. You monitor your patient's mental status, make sure you do a thorough neurologic assessment. You're gonna treat the underlying causes. If there's an infection or if the patient is taking a diuretic, you need to correct that problem. If the patient is dehydrated, meaning they just have a volume loss and a sodium loss also, you're gonna replace that with isotonic fluid therapy. So the patient will get 0.9% um, saline. They'll get normal saline. And that will replace the volume that they lost and the salt will come up as well. If it's severe, patients can receive salt tabs or hypertonic saline, but it's just important to use caution and closely monitor these patients. Most places, if your patient's receiving hypertonic saline, will have some sort of protocol with sodium checks every six hours or every four hours. And if the patient has hyponatremia that's been going on for a long time, so a chronic hyponatremia, it has to be done really slowly and with frequent laboratory checks to make sure that you don't cause too large of a shift in the sodium because that also can cause neurologic damage. And if your hyponatremia is severe, make sure that you institute seizure precautions to protect your patient. Hypernatremia is a sodium greater than 145. It occurs with either loss of water or gain of sodium. Um, and this is seen 
seen most often in elderly patients who are having an acute infection. Um, if they're unable to replace fluids lost due to impaired thirst and or restricted access to fluids. It can also occur because of diuretic use, saltwater drowning, diabetes insipidus, also known as DI in brain injured patients, or Cushing syndrome. Hypernatremia leads to a hyperosmolar state in the body which causes cell shrinkage and can lead to brain injury. Rapid replacement of free water in this situation can lead to cerebral edema. So you want to make sure if your patient is hypernatremic, you correct it carefully and slowly. Actually the provider caring for the patient will be the one to direct care, but you as the nurse will want to make sure that it's done carefully and slowly. Signs and symptoms of hypernatremia include tachycardia, hypertension, dry mucous membranes, thirst, flushed skin, and nausea. A patient's BUN and creatinine may be increased, and a patient's hematocrit and chloride may also be increased. Salt and chloride typically go together. Um, if it is severe, your patient may have a hyperreflexia, twitching, tremor, seizure, or coma. This is a nice mnemonic that helps me remember the symptoms of hypernatremia, fried salt, uh, flushed skin and low-grade fever. Patients are often restless, irritable, anxious, and confused. They may have increased blood pressure and fluid retention. They can have peripheral and pitting edema, decreased urine output, and a dry mouth with skin flushed, agitation, low-grade fever, and thirst. And please review the table in Lewis on page 279 about sodium. How do you treat hypernatremia? You replace the volume loss, uh, usually with normal saline. If the um, patient has a high intake of salt, you're going to decrease their sodium intake in their diet. Make sure that you assess these patients carefully for any neurologic changes, especially when you're replacing them. And you're going to treat any disease state or underlying cause. Make sure the patient has access to free water. Make sure that you monitor their urine output, their urine specific gravity, and the BUN. Moving on to potassium, a potassium of less than 3.5 is hypokalemia. Potassium is a chief regulator of cellular enzyme activity and water content in the body. Uh, hypokalemia can be caused by vomiting, gastric suction, diarrhea, diuretic use, hypoglycemia, which can shift potassium into the cells and out of the extracellular fluid, and water intoxication. Hypokalemia symptoms include fatigue, decreased deep tendon reflexes, muscle weakness, a weak, thready pulse, cardiac dysrhythmias, lethargy, shallow respirations, and dyspnea, and anxiety and depression. And I had a patient once who had a potassium of like 2.4, and I went in to talk to him and I said, you know, how you feeling? And he looked at me and he said, I feel like crap. And Patients that have a low potassium typically feel like crap. They have like no energy. They just do not feel good. So, um, you know, make sure that you replace these patients when their potassiums are low. Um, for treatment, you're going to encourage your patient to increase their dietary intake of potassium. You know, everybody knows that bananas have a lot of potassium in them, but what you might not know is that potatoes actually have a lot of potassium in them. So encourage your patients to eat potassium rich foods. Um, replace potassium if your, patient, if your um, facility has a protocol. You can follow that protocol as long as your patient's kidneys work and per the provider orders. So it's always, you know, if you have a patient and you realize their potassium came back low, you want to call the provider and see if they want to replace it if you don't have a protocol order. Make sure that these patients have their lab values monitored and if they're getting IV potassium, it is irritating to the veins. So make sure that you know which um, strength of potassium you're giving. If you're giving it intravenously, there are certain strengths that can only be given through a central line. 
If you're giving a patient 10 ml equivalents in 100 mLs, you can give that usually through a peripheral line, but try not to give it too fast. And your patients will often complain that the potassium is irritating. So make sure you're using caution. Hyperkalemia is a potassium greater than 5. The normal value is 3.5 to 5.0. This is caused um, by massive tissue damage causing the intracellular fluid to enter the extracellular fluid. Remember, potassium is mostly inside the cells. So if you have a big crush injury or a car accident, the patient's potassium can be increased because those cells have been broken and the intracellular fluid is now part of the extracellular fluid. Um, can also occur because of kidney failure, excessive dietary intake of potassium, like salt substitute potassium sparing diuretic use like spironolactone can have an increased potassium for the patient GI bleeding overdose and burns symptoms of hyperkalemia include an irregular slow heart rate decreased blood pressure EKG changes which are peaked T waves widened QRS and ectopy um, remember the cardiac muscle is very sensitive to potassium and weakness and paralysis may also occur. Treatment for hyperkalemia includes diuretic therapy, uh, decrease the dietary intake, you can give a patient k you can give them IV insulin, dextrose, and glucose to shift the potassium back into the cell. Um, you can also use albuterol for treatment and patients may need dialysis if they have renal failure or if the potassium is very high, like seven. Um, this is a nice slide illustrating the EKG changes found in potassium uh, excess and decrease. So here is a patient with a little bit of hyperkalemia, so mild hyperkalemia 5.5 to 6.5, you will see um, peak T waves. You'll have a prolonged PR segment. Moderate hyperkalemia, a value of 6.5 to 8, you'll see the P wave goes away, so there's no little bump here in the beginning. The QRS is prolonged, it's very wide. The ST segment is also elevated over here, and you'll see unusual beats at this point. You'll see ectopic beats and possibly escape rhythms. And this patient with a potassium of eight, uh, they're at risk of dying. So this, this potassium of eight is very high. And you see how wide this QRS is. It's just like a big wave over here. And eventually what's gonna happen is this will turn into what's called a sine wave, which is just like an, like a little wave going back and forth. Um, patients then can devolve into uh, V-fib, they can have asystole, which is no heartbeat at all, and um, other kinds of blocks can occur with a potassium that high. Um, when you, if you ever work in critical care, you'll get patients that have severe hyperkalemia and they'll dialyze the patient to pull off that extra potassium. And you can watch the monitor. I used to do this when I worked nights in the ICU and the dialysis people would come in and hook up your patient. And you could actually watch the EKG as it went back to normal once the potassium was pulled from the blood and their heart kind of got back to a normal EKG, which looks like this up top here. But so huge difference, right? This nice little narrow QRS, a P wave, a nice T wave to, you know, this kind of widened aberrant beat down here. Uh, here's a mnemonic to help you remember signs and symptoms of hyperkalemia, murder, muscle cramps, urine abnormalities, respiratory distress, decreased cardiac contractility, EKG changes, and reflexes. And please review your potassium table in Lewis, page 281. Okay, hypocalcemia. Calcium value that's less than 8.9 milligrams per deciliter is considered hypocalcemia. 
Um, potassium plays an important role in blood coagulation and transmission of nerve impulses. It regulates muscle contraction and relaxation, and it's a major component of bones and teeth. Uh, hypocalcemia is caused by inadequate intake or impaired absorption and excessive calcium loss. Hypocalcemia symptoms are numbness and tingling of fingers, mouth, or feet, tetany, muscle cramps, and seizures, and you treat it by replacing calcium. Educate the patient regarding good dietary, dietary sources of calcium and ensure absorption. You can make sure the patient takes their calcium supplement with some orange juice to help it be better absorbed. These videos, please take some time to watch them because they're good examples of what a patient looks like with a low calcium. There are a couple tests, Shavastox and Trousseau signs that can show hyperexcitability of the nerves if the patient's calcium is low. And please review your table in Lewis on page 283 about calcium. Hypercalcemia is a value greater than 10.1 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, two major causes of hypercalcemia are cancer and hyperparathyroidism. Uh, symptoms of a high calcium are nausea, vomiting, constipation, bone pain, excessive urination, thirst, confusion, lethargy, and slurred speech, and in severe cases, cardiac arrest can result. Treatment depends on the severity of symptoms and the underlying cause. Make sure that you replace the patient's volume and encourage weight-bearing mobilization if indicated. Patients that are bed-bound sometimes will have high calciums just because their bones are demineralizing because they're no longer weight-bearing. Magnesium, uh, hypomagnesemia, is a magnesium less than 1.5 milliequivalents milliequiv per liter. Um, it aids metabolism of carbohydrates and proteins. It activates intracellular enzyme systems, plays a role in neuromuscular function, and it asks acts on the cardiovascular system as a vasodilator. Hypomag can occur with NG suctioning, diarrhea, alcohol withdrawal, artificial nutrition administration, sepsis, and burns. And patients that have um, issues with alcohol use can have really aberrant electrolytes. So I always um, worry if these patients aren't on a cardiac monitor if they're withdrawing from alcohol because you can see some strange things with these patients. Um, hypomagnesemia symptoms include muscle weakness, tremors, tetany, seizures, heart block, mental status changes, increased deep tendon reflexes, and respiratory paralysis. Hypomagnesemia treatment involves PO or IV replacement and increased dietary intake of magnesium. So for magnesium, if you're giving a patient IV magnesium replacement, you wanna make sure that you follow your guidelines and administer it at the correct rate because with patients who are sensitive to it, magnesium administered too quickly can cause hypotension. So you wanna make sure you're giving it at the correct rate if you're giving IV replacement. Hypermag, a magnesium greater than 2.5, occurs with renal failure when the kidneys are unable to excrete mag or from excessive PO intake. So milk of magnesia, um, malox, antacids and laxatives that contain magnesium, if the patient takes them often, they may have a hypermagnesemia from that. Uh, symptoms include nausea, vomiting, weakness, flushing, lethargy, loss of deep tendon reflexes, respiratory depression, coma, and cardiac arrest. And hypermag treatment involves stopping PO or IV replacement, um, and calcium gluconate may be helpful to stabilize cardiac symptoms in severe cases. And please review magnesium in your Lewis book, page 286. Um, just as a side note, um, 
Women who are um, having pregnancy complications can be given magnesium as treatment um, because it will prevent seizures and it will relax the circulatory system. Um, and those patients are going to be um, given a hypermagnesemia like on purpose. So my sister-in-law was having a baby and her blood pressure was very high and they were trying to treat her with magnesium and they brought out this huge like 500 ml bag of magnesium to infuse into her and I and I was shocked because I worked in the ICU and we usually had these like 50 ml bags they were pretty tiny with two grams of mag in each bag and I said well how much magnesium are you giving her and they said we want her around four so they were um, inducing a hypermagnesemia to protect her and to protect the baby from side effects from her blood pressure but I was just I remember seeing that huge bag of magnesium and it was so surprising to me phosphate in the body provides energy storage it aids metabolism it regulates hormone and coenzyme activity and it has an inverse relationship with calcium hypophosphatemia is less than 2.5 milligrams per deciliter um, it can result from artificial nutrition being given to malnourished patients, which is a very special uh, syndrome called refeeding syndrome. It can occur from alcohol withdrawal, DKA, hypoventilation. It can occur with insulin release, absorption problems, and diuretic use. And a lot of times patients that I take care of in the ICU who have low phosphate, it's mostly because they have bad nutrition and now they're critically ill and they're using up all their reserves. So you can see hypophos develop pretty quickly for in your sick patients in the hospital. Symptoms include irritability, fatigue, weakness, paresthesias, stiffness, confusion, seizures, and coma. And treatment is to replace your low phosphorus levels before you initiate tube feedings. So you might have to give your patient IV phosphorus and make sure that their level comes up at least to greater than 2.5 or 2.7, and then they can start receiving artificial nutrition and you want to monitor your patient's eyes and nose. Hyperphos is a phos greater than four and a half. Uh, common causes are impaired kidney excretion and hyperparathyroidism. It uh, can also occur if patients take a lot of phosphate-based enemas. Um, symptoms include tetany, anorexia, nausea, muscle cramping, and tachycardia. And treatment is to treat the underlying causes. So hyperparathyroidism usually is treated with surgical fixes. Um, and if your patient is taking too many phosphate-based enemas, you have to stop them from doing that. And you're going to monitor your patient's intake. Um, and review phosphorus in Lewis, uh, page 285. Chloride is the um, major component of interstitial and lymphatic fluid, gastric and pancreatic juices, sweat, bile and saliva. It acts with sodium to maintain osmotic pressure and regulates acid-base balance. Almost all of the chloride in your diet comes from salt, so sodium chloride. And chloride and sodium pretty much do go together. Hypochloremia is less than 96 milliequivalents per liter. This can result from severe vomiting and diarrhea, drainage of gastric fluid, diuretic use, and burns. Manifestations include hyperexcitability of muscles, tetany, hyperactive deep tendon reflexes, weakness and muscle cramps and the treatment for hypochloremia is to replace your GI losses give them adequate fluid replacement correct the cause so if your patient's hyperchloremic because of diuretic use you're going to have to make sure that that treatment is adjusted Hyperchloremia is a chloride greater than 106 milliequivalents per liter. It can result from metabolic acidosis, head trauma, increased perspiration, excess ACH production, and decreased kidney function. However, in hospital patients, it is almost always iatrogenic, which means we did this to them. 
um, it is caused by administration of sodium chloride IV solution. So patients who get a lot of uh, volume resuscitation with regular sodium chloride, their chloride is going to go up as a result of this. Symptoms of hyperchloremia include tachypnea, weakness, lethargy, diminished cognitive ability, hypertension, decreased cardiac output, dysrhythmias, and it can lead to coma. Hyperchloremia treatment is to determine and treat the cause and monitor. Bicarbonate is the major buffer in the body in both the extracellular and the intracellular fluid. The normal serum level of bicarbonate is 22 to 26 milliequivalents per liter. It maintains the acid-base balance by functioning as the primary buffer in the body. It can be lost through gastric losses, diarrhea, di diarrhea diuretics, and renal insufficiency. It can be high if a person ingests quantities of acid neutralizers, such as sodium bicarb. We're not really going to talk about this today because bicarb is much more pertinent to acid base, so you'll learn more about bicarbonate next year. So when you have a patient that you feel is at risk for a volume balance or an electrolyte imbalance, you're going to make sure that you, um, you know, you're going to identify those patients. So who are these patients? Patients that have heart failure, patients that have kidney failure, patients that are acutely ill and unable to take in enough fluid to meet their requirements, patients with a fever who are having insensible losses, patients who have GI bug and are having like constant vomiting or diarrhea. They're going to have hypopotassium and hypochloride because they're losing all their gastric secretions. Um, then you're going to determine that a specific imbalance is present and determine its severity, the cause, and the characteristics. So if I, you know, see a patient in the nursing home who's been taking Lasix for their, you know, most of their adult life because they have hypertension and they have, you know, been having a potassium replacement and their potassium is like 3.5 and their sodium is 132 and that's not a new change for them. Yes, they have a hyponatremia because their sodium is low, but it's not the type of thing that just happened today and they're probably walking around feeling fine. So remember your nursing assessment, you're going to determine is this severe enough or is the cause something that you can treat with a nursing diagnosis? And how does your patient look? You know, does your patient look okay? Or is your patient lethargic and weak and complaining that they don't feel well? So remember, you're going to look at each situation individually. And from there, you're going to determine, is this serious? How did this happen? Is it something that we can treat with a nursing care plan? Um, is this something that I need to talk to a provider about? Maybe the patient's potassium is 3.1 and they're feeling miserable because their potassium is low. And maybe I need to call the nurse practitioner taking care of this patient and ask for a potassium replacement so that they can have their potassium at a regular level and feel more comfortable. So that's a collaborative problem. That's not a nursing diagnosis there because it requires a team approach to treat. You're going to identify your specific outcomes and associated interventions for your patients. You're going to determine the effectiveness of the plan of care and you can certainly review your Trees and Wilkinson assessment data in, on pages 14, 76 to 77 and review in your Lewis book the assessment of fluid and electrolyte imbalances because these um, can be really tricky. You know, if your patient is chronically hyponatremic because they're on a diuretic, they may not need intervention and you may be able to just monitor that as the nurse. But if your patient, you know, has heart failure and they have a volume overload and they're having trouble breathing, that's something that you as a nurse need to address right away. So try and, you know, take some time and get to know what these different imbalances are and what the assessment looks like. 
So fluid volume deficit, we talked about this a little bit already, also known as hypovolemia, dehydration, dry skin mucous membranes, non-elastic skin turgor, decreased urine output and blood pressure, hypotension, and increased heart rate, tachycardia. They can have a rise in temperature and patients can have weight loss. As the nurse, how are you going to manage fluid volume deficit? You're going to keep track of eyes and O's. You're going to check the lab values. You're going to assess the cardiovascular system. Do they have weak pulses? Are they hypotensive? You're going to assess the respiratory system and tissue perfusion. Check their cap refill. Check the patient's orientation, vision, hearing, reflexes, and muscle strength check for weight changes. Cardiac patients you'll see frequently will get daily weights and they'll be done at the same time every day in the same exact clothing because these patients weight changes often indicate fluid volume changes. You're going to check for skin breakdown and make sure the patient has good oral care and you're going to watch those patients closely for developing complications. For fluid volume excess, your patients look like this picture here. They have hypervolemia, too much fluid on board. They can have an elevated blood pressure, bounding pulse, pale, cool skin. They can have edema in the ankles and legs or ascites in the abdomen. And you might hear crackles because of pulmonary edema, excess fluid in the lungs. You're going to discover your um, different assessment parameters while doing your nursing history and your physical assessment on your patients. You're going to be monitoring their intake and output, daily weights if they have them ordered, and their laboratory studies. All of these things will help tell you if your patient is overloaded or dry. And these are just some lab studies used to assess for imbalances. The complete blood count. Remember, if you're thinking of a patient's uh, blood volume as their soup, if they um, are dry, their soup is going to be a little more salty. They're going to have uh, more concentrated H&H. &H. If their soup is too dilute, they have too much fluid on board, their H&H &H is going to be low because it will be diluted. You're going to check your patient's electrolytes, the blood urea nitrogen and creatinine levels, make sure their kidneys work, find out how, many, how much waste products are in their blood. You can check urine pH and specific gravity to see if they're peeing concentrated urine or if their urine is dilute. And also arterial blood gases are something that's monitored, but that is next year. You're not going to have that this year, so to be continued for ABGs. Risk factors for imbalances, we talked about this a little bit. We mentioned heart failure and kidney failure, other pathophysiology, such as any underlying acute and chronic illnesses, abnormal losses of body fluids, burns are at terrible risk for um, fluid and electrolyte imbalances, as well as patients in trauma. Um, patients that have surgery, surgery actually, um, patients that are in surgery lose a lot of fluid because they're open, um, because of the OR environment. Usually you want to make sure those patients are replaced adequately after their surgeries. And any therapies that disrupt fluid and electrolyte balance, um, specifically diuretics, are some of the biggest culprits for um, electrolyte and volume imbalance. And patients that are debilitated, that don't have a good thirst mechanism, or who can't access good PO intake, they're also going to be at risk for imbalance. These are some nursing diagnosis related to imbalances in fluid and electrolytes. Um, excess fluid volume, fluid overload, deficient fluid volume, hypovolemia, and risk for imbalanced fluid volume. None of these people look like they're at risk. They're staying hydrated. This gentleman's exercising. They all look very good. So your expected outcomes for your patients with fluid and electrolyte imbalances, you want to make sure that they maintain 
good fluid at intake and output balance. So your patient should be drinking well, your patient should be peeing well, you want to make sure that they stay even. You want the urine specific gravity to be within a normal range, which is 1010 to 1025. Um, nice yellow urine like in this Foley bag is always something that nurses like to see when they're taking care of these patients. Um, you want to encourage them to practice self-care behaviors to promote balance, especially patients who have electrolyte imbalances because of the use of over-the-counter medications or the salt substitutes. You want to make sure that they're well educated and that they can maintain you know, homeostasis without using anything that's going to throw their electrolytes off. And please review the guidelines for INO in the TREES book, page 1495-96. to 96. For implementation, uh, patients may need dietary modifications. They may need to modify their fluid intake. Um, you want to be very cautious administering medications to patients with fluid and electrolyte imbalances, especially things like diuretics. Um, you're going to make sure that if your patient has our artificial fluids running, IV fluids, you want to know why and what fluid is infusing. Um, patients that have loss of blood may need replacement of blood or blood products. Also, TPN or total parenteral nutrition is like IV nutrition. That's something that should be used with caution and you're going to want to monitor these patients eyes and nose as well as their electrolytes. Same thing for tube feeding that's given via a G-tube or an NG tube. Artificial nutrition can be a cause of electrolyte disturbance so you want to be cautious and monitor when you're giving patients this nutrition. Make sure that if your patient is anxious, you do your best to educate them and to help them understand what the treatment is that they're getting. And make sure that you take your time and give good patient and family teaching because this may be something that they can prevent by staying on top of you know, their diuretic use or their fluid volume or their salt intake. You know. Oftentimes, these care plans for patients are going to be highly individualized because every patient is different and what works for one patient may not work for another. So for the end of the lecture, we have a case study. Um, five members of the LaGuardia family have all come into the emergency room complaining of nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea related to severe gastroenteritis, a viral intestinal disorder. The family members include eight-month-old Jason, grandson of Jackson, 26-year-old Susanna, Jackson's daughter and Jason's mother, 60-year-old Jackson, 58-year-old Gemma, Jackson's wife, and 82-year-old Martha, Jackson's mother. So these patients all have nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. So they have gastroenteritis. So they can't keep anything down. So what fluid imbalance do you expect these patients to have? probably hypovolemia, right? Because they're not able to keep anything down. Everything they take in is going out one way or the other. Um, and which of these patients are more at risk for hypovolemia? It's going to be the little baby, the eight-month-old, and the elderly woman, the 82-year-old. Those two are the most at risk for fluid imbalance because the elderly person is more susceptible to an acute illness and has less water content because she's female and she's elderly. The eight-month-old Jason has a large amount of water content. He's 75% water being a little baby, and he is also going to be more at risk for um, volume deficit, especially because he's ill and he we don't know if he's breastfed or bottle fed, but he, if he's vomiting and having diarrhea, he's going to end up in trouble a lot quicker than a 26-year-old or even a 60-year-old. So I would suspect the elderly woman and the young baby to be the most at risk for fluid imbalance. Um, so based on the information you have learned about the major electrolytes of the body, which electrolytes are most likely to be out of balance in members of the LaGuardia family? So they're vomiting and they have diarrhea. So volume deficit, hypovolemia, and as far as electrolytes, 
you're thinking gastric secretions. So they're going to have hypokalemia. They're going to have hypochloremia. And they might, depending on how long they've been sick, they might have hyponatremia as well. But I usually think potassium and chloride, the two major um, GI um, electrolytes. All right, so take some time and study your electrolytes. If you have any questions when you're going over the material, don't hesitate to contact me. Uh, my email is eljones at stcc.eu. And uh, we'll go over uh, another bunch of case studies when we have our Zoom lecture on this material. Thank you so much.